Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of MIT, welcome to the MIT ROP webinar series on digital transformation. In this digital economy, companies are increasingly moving towards digital transformation. Data is becoming the most important assets for many industries. For example, in the US, data accounts for now more than half of US industry assets, replacing the traditional brick and mortar assets. Now this is increasing every year and this is happening all around the world. Companies tries to capture the value of data by using technologies, such as the importance of digi digital transformation. In this webinar, we will hear from two different groups at MIT, including MIT Startup Exchange, uh, that will present startups in COVID-19 detections and machine learning. We will also hear from uh, MIT Digital Currency Initiative, the director of this initiative, and she will talk about blockchain applications and digital currency research at MIT. I would like to welcome our first speaker, Rebecca Xiong, the program director at MIT Startup Exchange. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, David. That's right. At the MIT Startup Exchange, we connect 1,900 MIT startups to industry. Today, for the first hour, we have an exciting lineup of three of those startups talking about how they're leading digital transformation right now during this COVID-19 time. Earlier in the digital transformation series, you might have heard from Ginny Ross on how businesses are digitally transforming in two ways. First, by becoming digitized for operational excellence the others to become digital for rapid business innovation. And it sounds like many of you are pursuing both right now. Our three startups today will offer some very interesting thoughts on both of these fronts. First up is Kinza, which has transformed the Humboldt thermometer into a powerful tool for early detection and prediction of COVID-19 and other infectious diseases to help keep our communities safe. Next, we have Tamer, which has helped companies unify diverse data across silos to help drive hundreds of millions in savings and improve operational efficiency. Lastly, Tagout enables companies to better manage critical industrial access, assets using predictive le machine learning. We have these three startups each speak for about 10 minutes, followed by 25 minutes of Q&A and panel discussion. So please hold all your questions post all your questions to the Q&A button down below so that the, we can answer them during that set part of the, today's program. It's with a great pleasure that I introduce our very first speaker. Inder Singh is the founder and CEO of Kinza and previously served as the executive vice president of the Kington Health Access Initiative, where he worked with the US president's Malaria Initiative and the Gates Foundation and the World Health Organization. He broke a serious agreement between 70 developing countries and 20 pharmaceutical companies that lowered the price of medicine for AIDS, malaria, and TB, enabling millions of children to get access to treatment uh, to these disease. And it holds three graduate degrees from Harvard and MIT. Over to you, Inder. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Inder. I'm the founder and CEO of Kinsa. Uh, I'm an HST 07 grad, an MBA 06 grad. It's great to be speaking to an MIT audience. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit about what we're doing today on COVID-19, and then I'll back into what we've done before COVID-19. Um, this is not new for us. Our mission is to detect outbreaks in real time and predict them. On March 18th, we launched healthweather.us. Um, I'm going to give you a live demo here. This is healthweather.us. What you see on this map is fever levels across the country. Specifically, you see unusual fever levels, fever levels that go above and beyond what you ordinarily expect for cold and flu season. And so I'm just clicking on one county. Let's pick Manhattan because I think Manhattan's a small county here. I think everyone is familiar with Manhattan. So what you see on healthweather.us is, again, this orange and red uh, line is essentially real-time fever signals taken from our connected thermometers. I'll show you them in a moment. And you see a dash, dashed blue line here. That's the expected value of cold and flu season. That's a forecast that we've derived over the last 
six years for what you should expect in Manhattan for cold and flu season. You see a massive dip here. That's because social distancing started in New York. There was a policy decision to do shelter in place or stay at home. And of course, when you're doing so, you're, you're breaking the chain of infection. But what you saw in early March was a massive rise in fever levels. Fever levels that go, again, well above and beyond what you'd normally expect from cold and flu season. That's an unusual outbreak. Today, that's COVID-19. Uh, imagine if we had an 18-day early warning signal for COVID-19. Well, we did. Um, this map shows our atypical illness signal, that curve that I just showed you uh, between the expected value and the real-time fever signal. That's on the left in blue. On the right is the New York City death curve. If you displace our atypical illness curve by 18 days, they basically match. Um, for those of you that are that are very data inclined out there, the R squared on this is above 0 0.92 and the p-value is less than 0 0.001. And this is true across the country. We capture the early uh, signal of COVID-19 spread. It's true for hospitalizations, it's true for deaths, and it's true for cases. This particular graph is deaths. So as far as we can tell, this is the only effective early warning system for COVID-19 spread. There's been a number of others who published on this recently and a number of scientists and public health officials that are um, endorsing the idea of distributing more of these. These are the smart thermometers that made that chart and made that healthweather.us map available. Right, this is nothing new. All we're doing is syndromic surveillance. For those of you in the, uh, in the public health sphere, it's the term is syndromic surveillance. I don't like the word surveillance, so you're not gonna hear me use it beyond stating that uh, phrase just now. Um, I like the idea, I like, I like calling it early warning. That's essentially what we're doing. We're able to talk to people when they're still in their homes before they ever enter the healthcare system. And we're able to not only help guide them to the care and services they need, but through that interaction and through interactions with millions of those households and many more millions of users, because there's many, there's usually several users per household, we're able to collect data on where and when symptoms are starting, how fast they're spreading and how bad those symptoms get. And that 18 day displacement that you saw, that has a biological underpinning. The reason we selected 18 days is because that's the average time from symptom onset to death based on the latest CDC data. So there's actually a biological underpinning to what we're seeing here. Um, let me take a step back and talk about what Kinsa does normally. And, um, and what we do normally, our mission is to curb the spread of infectious illness through earlier detection and earlier response. This was not an idea we came up with on a napkin. This was not an afterthought of making the connected thermometer. The thermometer was part and parcel to this mission from inception. Over the past six years, since we launched the first digital connected, we call them smart thermometers, we've been able to uh, look at uh, and essentially map the flu signature on a location by location basis across the country. Today, we can predict flu-like illness spread 12 to 20 weeks out. Let's compare that to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and their best academic partners. Uh, Carnegie Mellon is, is, has won the, the competition on flu forecasting by the CDC for the past five years. Those groups can predict flu spread two to three weeks out on a multi-state level. So there's two dimensions. One is timelier. Um, again, we're 12 to 20 weeks out. And two is on a, the, the geographic basis. Uh, we're able to predict it on a city-by-city -city basis, not just a multi-state basis. And that's the derivation of how we're able to detect COVID. We're actually removing the signature of cold and flu. Um, I'm going to show you a video now that basically tells our whole story from start to finish um, and tells us, tells you specifically what we're doing with COVID-19. They say that knowledge is power. Never has that been more true than with the COVID-19 crisis. Early knowledge on where and when illness is spreading gives us the power to stop it, keeping our country and economy safe and protecting our way of life. Kinsa has built an early warning system to track and stop the spread of illness. With more than 1 million smart thermometers in use across the country today, our system detected COVID-19 spread nearly three weeks before case numbers surged. With this early information on where illness is starting and spreading, our leaders can make informed decisions on how best to keep our communities safe, healthy, and prosperous. 
Because fever is so often the first sign of a contagious illness like COVID, the more Americans using Kinsa thermometers, the more precise our early warning system can be. Our homes, our schools, and our workplaces are the foundations of our society. These are also the places where illness spreads fast, so we focus our efforts here. While completely protecting individual privacy, Kinsa gives your community the knowledge needed to stop the spread. With more information on what's going around, schools and workplaces can take actions like increased disinfecting, testing, or use of protective gear. And this same information gives you the knowledge to make the right decisions for your family. If you're healthy but may have been exposed at work or school, Kinsa guides you to the right actions to stay well. If you or a loved one is sick, Kinsa helps you detect and respond to your illness. By using Kinsa, you help yourself and your family get better faster. You help your community stop the spread of illness. And you help your healthcare system, your state, and your country contain outbreaks early. Because knowledge is power. So that's a little bit about what we do. I realize that there's a number of folks on the line who represent corporations today. So I want to focus in on what we're doing for back to school and back to work in particular. Um, you saw a little bit in those videos. We take our illness signals, um, these early signals on where and when illness is spreading, and we provide them back to the community. Uh, we've been doing that for about six years with schools, about 2,000 schools across the country, and the results of that program are really wonderful. Um, we've seen a decrease in illness-based absenteeism, We've seen earlier access to care. 85% uh, of those schools are Title I. They're underserved schools. 40% of the users didn't even have, 40% of the households didn't even have a thermometer uh, at the beginning of that program, but they had a smartphone. And so they were able to use the thermometer and smartphone connection to get care and services uh, earlier and, again, avoid unnecessary care. And then school nurses who run that program in each one of those 2,000 schools um, really, uh, it's amazing to hear their stories. Um, they talk about how there's less kids coming into school sick. Um, there's not only less illness-based absenteeism, they're actually seeing less children on a daily basis in the school sick. Um, we've now adapted that program to the workplace. The functionality is actually very similar, but we were approached by a prominent Fortune 500 company based in Boston, um, who we know, um, who said, hey, we're, we're aware of this program. Can you adapt it to the workplace as a back-to-work solution? Um, since that time, we've rolled it out to several other uh, Fortune 500 companies, and we're really excited that it's showing uh, the same kinds of impact um, today as it was showing in schools for flu season. So I'm going to show you that video for those of you that, again, for those of you that represent corporations, we are trying to roll this out as a, as a back-to-work solution. Kinsa's Well Together program helps employers bring their workforce back to the office safely and productively. The program provides visibility into the spread of illness within the workforce and directs sick employees to the care they need precisely when they need it. As an employee, I receive an award-winning Kinsa Smart Thermometer from my employer. When I download the Kinsa mobile app, I'm invited to join a private employee group, which allows me to see aggregate information on what symptoms and illnesses are going around my office. Each morning before I leave for work, Kinsa reminds me that it's time to check my temperature. Checking in with Kinsa is fast and easy. I get my temperature reading and know whether I have a fever or not. The app then guides me through a few quick questions about any symptoms I might be experiencing. For some of my colleagues with highly interactive jobs, they're required to show their symptom-free status before entering the building. When I do have a fever, Kinsa reminds me to stay home and gives me guidance on what to do next. The app even directs me to relevant benefits from my employer, like telemedicine or a coronavirus test, exactly when I need it. As an employee, I'm grateful to get the right care at the right time and take comfort in knowing that staying home is the right thing to do to prevent others from getting sick. As an HR manager, I can see aggregate illness trends for our entire employee population through a web portal. Knowing where and when illness is spreading, I can decide what steps to take to keep our workforce healthy and safe. Whether deep disinfecting is required, or whether more aggressive response measures like work from home policies and widespread testing should be implemented immediately. I can even communicate with specific offices in real time to reassure our workforce that their health and safety is our priority and update them on our response plans. 
the Pinces Well Together program, employers and employees can curb the spread of illness together. So I'll close with two thoughts. Um, one is, uh, you know, we've been around for eight years. Uh, I am grateful that we're still around. We survived uh, to get to this point in time because uh, we can help. Uh, I'm sad that it took a pandemic to bring to light how important this kind of work on early detection is, right? In any epidemic, you, there's a four part solution. One is early warning, two is widespread testing, three is treatment and isolation, and four is conferring immunity to the population through vaccines or uh, antibody testing. But the world doesn't have an early warning system. We set out to build one eight years ago, and today it's working. And we're really, really excited that we can help and hopefully help save lives. And as we get back to work, if you can detect outbreaks in real time, you can contain them. And that's the whole idea behind Kinsa. Thanks, guys. Great. Thank you so much, Inder, for that fascinating talk. I, I think it's uh, both um, very strong uh, encouragement to use data for digital transformation, but also to help keep uh, our community safe, our people safe. So a great call for to action. Next one, uh, we have uh, Li Tao. Li Tao Asher Doton is, our chief, is the chief growth officer at Tamer. In the past decade, Li Tao has led the marketing team in several hyper growth tech companies, including Cyber Reason, Panorama Education, and Rapid7. Prior to that, she spent over a decade at P&G, where she was leading the Open Innovation Hub in Israel and the greater Boston area. Li Tao, over to you. Such a great honor to be here and discuss the importance of data, especially in this time of COVID-19 pandemic. As we all seen, uh, a lot of our effort to deal uh, with um, COVID-19 are related to data. Um, as Kinza just showed, uh, early detection is only um, able uh, if we have the right data in place. Um, Tema is here to work with companies to solve the problem of data silos at scale. Uh, if we think about the COVID-19 testing, it's a massive data challenge. Um, if we are all sourcing our daily uh, digest of where we are at with the number of uh, people infected, number of death, uh, governors are relying on this to decide on the opening of the economy versus closure. Um, there are over 1,000 various da data sources uh, bringing in uh, information about um, COVID-19 testing. All of them are coming in different formats uh, in a variety of uh, data quality. And to be able to see a cohesive, real-time view of where we are in terms of uh, uh, COVID-19 spread and uh, rates of infection versus um, rates of uh, um, are they declining or are they increasing, we all need accurate, well-curated data. And this is a problem that we've seen in many organizations across the world. Um, similar to the COVID-19 problem of data, we see these data challenges across any organization. Um, any organization nowadays needs data in order to make decisions. Um, the same as governors need data in order to make decisions about opening the economy. The problem is that within um, a data, digital transformation journey, we're very often not succeeding. In fact, Gartner is estimating that 50 to 80% of data analytics projects fail. It is maybe because of data volume, velocity, and variety. In some cases, is because of things are too siloed and it's hard to bring them together. Uh, we're still heavily relying on manual data consolidation processes, which takes too time and are too labor intense. Um, accuracy and data quality are still big issues that prevent us from doing effective machine learning, AI, and, and making business decisions based on the data because we just cannot trust it. And some of the problems rely with our own way of dealing with the data. We have um, siloed organizations in large organizations, and it's hard to um, 
have fruitful collaboration around data between IT and businesses. Um, and at the end of the day, well, the business really needs data, needs quality data that is trustworthy, we still don't see us keeping the pace with this need. And in times of pandemic, this is becoming an even more true. So Tema is here to help organizations bridge the gap. We help them deliver business outcomes from the amount of data that they have by mastering the data at scales. We work with a variety of organizations across many industries with their data problems. And recently with COVID-19, we have seen a few matters that are more relevant than ever that we've recently been dealing with. How we do it before we jump into uh, how we are helping some organizations and what areas, we basically take whatever stage uh, a company is at in the digital transformation. Either they are already on the cloud, they're transitioning, they have multi-cloud, or they're still on-prem, we help them bring together a variety of data silos from Salesforce to ERP system to data lakes, whatever they have in place, we put the data together using machine learning um, guided by human experts that helps improve the, the machine learning models to be able to curate the data and make it ready for analytics and downstream machine learning to basically see a clean view. If you think of the COVID-19 example, uh, not have duplicates, have everything well curated together. How is it being used nowadays? One example that we've been recently uh, dealing with are issues with supply chain and uh, better risk mitigating of supply chain. With COVID-19 pandemic closures, many organizations have been agonizing with um, the shortage of raw materials, uh, problems in supply, and ever-changing demands uh, that are really hard to predict and handle. Uh, we've been working recently with many organizations to put together all the supply chain data from a variety of sources around the world and get a clear view of where companies are sourcing their materials, where they're currently stored, uh, to see what's the inventory level, and be able to superimpose it on COVID-19 um, closure maps to be able to see alternatives and make fast decisions. Um, in the past, we've worked with organization like GE in which we gave them a full understanding across the board um, on where all the parts are supplied from, all the suppliers they're working from. We consolidated data from over 75 ERP systems that they had, um, putting together 25 million records in really short time help them realize at the end of the day, 300 million in cost saving and finding the right alternatives and um, um, prioritizing the suppliers. Another area that we've recently worked with many companies and have been doing it for a long time is around the need to uh, have better um, view of spent and procurement. Organizations nowadays, I think no single organization is not worried about spend uh, with uh, the turnover in the economy. Um, and everybody has to have very clear view of direct and indirect spend. This is challenging in global organizations. This is challenging when we have multiple siloed data. Uh, having a clear view of procurement and when spend is going is something critical now more than ever. This is something that we've done uh, with a local organization called Thermo Fisher here at Waltham, um, a wonderful company that is actually very involved in, in the COVID-19 efforts. Um, we have done... a um, a significant project with them uh, to try and classify the spend, understand the different areas that they are spending money with which suppliers and be able to better categorize and make decisions about priorities and see um, some uh, um, spend reduction. 
And last but not least, we have been working with the world's largest pharmaceutical company. GSK is one of them. We've been working them uh, for uh, almost seven years now, working on clinical data realization. If you think about it um, now more than ever, time to market is critical and being able to put together data from widespread clinical trials, putting together also historical clinical trials data and be able to help um, make decisions uh, from um, candidates uh, uh, selection all the way to overseeing uh, real world data and its impact. That's something that is critical nowadays as companies race into COVID-19 treatment, into vaccination. We've been working with several of the largest uh, pharma companies, helping them with this mastering together. And we are really looking forward to um, helping more and discussing how we can put data to action, helping make us fast in in, uh, finding um, a solution. So with that, um, I will get back to Rebecca. I'm very happy to answer questions. Um, this is my email um, and feel free to post into the Q&A, please. Great, thank you, Lital. Next, we have John Garrity, who's a co-founder and CEO of TagUp. Before that, she, he was a project manager at GE Energy developing and deploying analytics technology to improve the reliability of electrical infrastructure. He has broad experience in clean energy technologies, is on the board of directors at Greentown Labs. John has an MBA from Harvard Business School and an undergrad from MIT. John? Great, thanks, Rebecca. So hello, everyone. Thanks for, for joining. Uh, I'm John Garrity, co-founder and CEO of TagUp. We apply new machine learning methods to optimize industrial equipment operation. Uh, and I'm just gonna give a brief presentation today on, on their company and some of the uh, voice of customer I've heard from our customers and partners, the impact of the pandemic on, on asset management um, and the, the impacts they're seeing in both demand and day-to-day -day operation. So our company, uh, we're a team, uh, came out of MIT, we're a team of data scientists and software engineers uh, our mission is to use AI to make the machines that power the world safer, more reliable, more efficient. Uh, we work primarily in energy, so everything from power generation, uh, whether that's wind turbines or cogeneration or a variety of other sources, uh, through transmission and distribution with regulated utilities. We also do work in processed water uh, and in defense. So the methods are, are very broadly applicable uh, with the objective of making the equipment more efficient and, and safer. The core of the technology, we take all varieties of data sources. So we'll get equipment sensor measurements. We'll get data you might have in ERP, transactional data. Uh, we take nameplate information, the manufacturer, the year of manufacture, all varieties of equipment data types. And we combine that to predict equipment failure, to identify anomalous operation, uh, and to make improvements in supply chain and inventory management. The, the value proposition comes in a few ways. Uh, primarily, it's in operation of the asset. So avoiding equipment breakdown, avoiding bus business interruption costs associated with equipment failure. Uh, but we also generate improvements with respect to supply chain. So if you can understand when equipment is going to fail or when you need that spare part, you can improve procurement and you can improve uh, inventory management associated with those assets. So focus of the talk, I wanna talk about uh, asset management in, in the current world and what we're seeing uh, in terms of the impact the pandemic is having on, uh, on energy companies, on, on water delivery, uh, on a variety of sort of critical infrastructure. Uh, and there are impacts both on the demand side, uh, we're seeing major shifts in demand in some cases, and also with respect to operations for these, for these companies and trying to keep critical infrastructure working. Uh, so the first, uh, focusing on demand, uh, the biggest one, the priority is really understanding what changes in demand are we seeing. Uh, and, you know, equipment is sized for a certain level of demand. And the pandemic is materially shifting uh, where that demand occurs, how much demand. Uh, and so capacity planning is becoming key. 
And I think one of the big questions that's been surfaced in our conversations with customers is how, how persistent are these shifts? You have a picture to the right of New York City. Uh, we work with Con Edison, for example, as electric utility for New York. Uh, and as you can imagine, Midtown Manhattan has substantially suppressed uh, electricity demand. Uh, no one's in the offices. Uh, and so you're seeing a shift in demand from, from high density urban clusters, office, commercial and industrial in particular, uh, out to residential. And the infrastructure is not sized for this, and right? it's it's going to be underutilized for for Midtown Manhattan in this example, uh, and oversized now out in the suburbs. Uh, and the question is how how persistent will these shifts be? Will this occur during peak season uh, through the summer? And I think these these sorts of questions are are generally applicable when you look at utilization of your capital base, uh, your your in, your install base for equipment. Uh, is it sized correctly? How do you think about long-term changes as a result of the pandemic? Um, there's also these geographically varied demand changes. So this is this is relevant both for uh, a more localized utility like Con Edison, but also for energy companies or, or infrastructure companies with a much more distributed install base. Uh, you're seeing changes in demand that uh, are asymmetric across the service territory, and it's important to consider these as well. Uh, on the operations side, there's a number of factors, right? So uh, the biggest one and how we like to frame it is in terms of failure liability. So this is if, if equipment is to fail, what is, what is the cost of that failure? And, and generally you have operationally, you have the, the equipment breakdown cost, right? If you have a, if your car goes into the shot, you know, you're, you have a, um, an engine failure on your car, you have to replace the engine that has a real cost, but you also have the business interruption cost, right? You can't use that asset. Uh, and so if you're delivering energy or you're producing textiles, uh, you're going to see reductions in your ability to supply. Uh, and so what's changing now as we see the pandemic coming to play, uh, and I think Natal referenced is the supply chain disruptions. Whereas before you might have been able to get a replacement part or replacement asset in three months, it might now take six months or more. And so when you look at failure liability, which is again, the expected cost of failure, that's changing markedly as the access to replacement parts is changing. And what's happening as a result is you're seeing a change in the underlying economics. So now it's becoming more economical to maintain excess inventory, right? Relative to before the pandemic. Uh, it makes sense to have those spares in place uh, in order to make rapid replacements when you need to not have to worry about uh, external supply chain risk. Uh, it's also affecting the economics of automation. So installing new sensor sets for these assets, having more visibility, uh, especially in light of reduced access to site and potentially reduced workforce availability. And so we may have uh, in the future, there may be uh, reduced ability to work in close contact. You may have uh, reductions in productivity as a result of health issues. Uh, and so it's important to understand now what uh, workforce tasks can be automated through additional instrumentation, uh, through analytics to really prioritize what those key, key uh, tasks are uh, and ensure that the, the infrastructure remain, remains as reliable as it was pre-pandemic. So in quick summary, I, you know, I think we're seeing from, from our customers and our partners changes both on the, uh, again, the demand side that they're perceiving in some cases immense changes in demand, obviously, for industries like airlines, but in energy as well. Uh, and then operationally, things are changing day to day, you know, additional PPE requirements obviously change the operational cadence. Uh, but supply chain risk is coming into uh, major effect with respect to asset management strategies. You know, again, I, I think our customers have raised concerns about the availability of spares, the availability of, of parts, uh, and so asset management strategies are changing, becoming more conservative, rest, less reliant on, on, uh, on supp external supply chain. Uh, and I think both of these are sort of the key considerations we've seen in the context of asset management in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but I'm happy to take questions. That was just a quick overview of what we heard from our customers. And, and thank you uh, for including us, MIT. And back over to you, Rebecca.